uh, Friday Support Group, and we have two special guests uh, here today. To my left is Emily McGuire, who's a nutritionist from uh, all the way from uh, Scotland, from Edinburgh. Uh, awesome. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, Emily here in a minute. And to my right is our other special guest, Dave Dalton, who uh, is a producer locally here in um, Colorado. And uh, firstly, he's been kind enough to uh, videotape this uh, session today. And secondly, Dave is working on a um, uh, production at the present time called uh, Dave's Big Fat Diet. Can you tell us about that uh, real quick, Dave? Sure, real quick. Um, it's, a, it's a web series that I'll be launching um, later this year, and, and really it's a, it's a story. So it's, it's kind of uh, what we call film narrative. Uh, it's about an, an overweight a middle-aged guy who is struggling to lose weight uh, and decides he's got to do something about it. And uh, it's it's fiction, sort of. I play the fictionalized version of myself, really, what it is. Um, and it's 13 episodes, and I actually, as the actor, I have to lose the weight in 13 weeks. Uh, and in the series, it's uh, even though I'm going on uh, a keto diet. Um, uh, it's really not going to be a lot about the, 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 the nutrition, uh, not, not in this series. It's going to be more about the psychology. So I do have another character who plays my n nasty little voice that talks me out of reasonable decisions. So <laughs> it's a lighthearted comedy, but there's also moments where it's very relatable. Things that kind of get you like, ooh, I know that voice, I know that. Um, and Dr. Gerber has been kind enough to join us and partner up. With, he plays himself. He plays, <laughs> he plays himself. He plays my doctor. And uh, so we thought it'd be great to uh, come down. Me, the actor, come down and, and listen and, and kind of be inspired by you know what we're, what we're talking about. Once we wrap the, uh, that series and we air it, um, then we'll be getting into the hosted the business of hosting, which is basically. I'll have a cooking show, because I'm also a cook. Uh, we're doing a cooking show on, on uh, paleo and keto diets, and have experts on all that stuff, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, so maybe cool. we'll, we'll all have cameos in the, uh, <laughs> in the documentary. <laughs> so, yeah, so, okay, well let's talk about um, Emily here for a minute. So Emily, Emily McGuire um, is uh, online known as Low Carb Genesis, and she um, is from Edinburgh, Scotland, as I said before. And you have a, uh, let's see, a master's degree in nutrition and obesity science. Mm -hmm. And uh, Emily is now on five months of maybe months. a one-year tour mm -hmm. of the world, trying to figure out where she's going to do um, her research for PhD uh, in uh, nutrition science. And she has a particular interest in low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic cancer research. And so with that, um, just want to say that uh, you're new to our group, Emily and Dave, and so it's, it's very open and informal, but we're really excited to hear you talk a little <laughs> bit and tell us about your adventures. Yeah. Um, well, it's very nice to meet everyone. Thank <laughs> you for letting me come along. Um, as Jeff said, I left home about five months ago now. And I started off in South Africa, so at the conference that was held in South Africa. I don't know if you've spoken about that or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything. I think I was there. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, to, to tell these people here about it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. 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 They know. Um, they know. So, yeah. so that was the first stop. And then from there, I mean, obviously the conference was amazing, you know, and a great way to kick off the tour, if you like. And then from there, I went on to Australia. So I did the rounds in Australia, so I started off in Perth. Um, I had family in Perth, so I kind of tied in seeing the family type of thing. Um, I had a little bit of a trip to over to Bali in Indonesia as well, so it was quite a contrast to see the difference in food from there to the food in, in Indonesia, so that was quite interesting. And then made my way around, so Adelaide was the first stop. There is a big research facility there called Ciro. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but a lot of some of the low carb research that's kind of come out has come from that group as well. So I met with the researchers there. Then on to Melbourne, so with Dr. Rod Taylor, and met the low carbs down under people there, some dinners. 
onto Canberra and then up to Sydney to meet with Dr. Kieran Rooney. I don't know if anyone's kind of heard of him. He's at the University of Sydney. And then in between all that, just seeing, I mean, paleo in Australia is just massive. It is huge. I don't know if you've heard of kind of the names coming out. There's uh, Chef Pete Evans. I don't know if anyone's heard of him. Or So he's a really kind of famous TV chef over there. They have this cooking program called My Kitchen Rules and it's a thing you can apply and go on to and he's one of the judges on this program. And about 15 years ago he had a cookbook that came out that was all on Italian cooking and pizzas and you know whole grains and all this kind of thing. And he's now done a 180 and said it's all about paleo. So he's caused a massive stir in Australia and just before I left to go to Bali before coming back he was bringing out a cookbook with two nutritionists and again I don't know if it hit the news here but in one of the, the recipes that they had it's for babies and instead of giving your baby formula they want you to give your baby you know, liver and, and feed it kind of real food etc. So some dietitians in Australia saw this, complained about it, it was being published by Penguin Books and Penguin pulled it, it got completely pulled from the whole of the country. Dietitians were saying that he was going to kill babies. It got, it hit news all over the country. I mean, it was huge, it was massive. Luckily, they kept going with it and they've now found a new publisher and it's, you know, it's uh, been published and it's a very great success story, etc. There is hundreds of paleo cafes, their food is just influenced by it. They're, there's a chain now called Thrive. And it's kind of like a cafeteria style um, chain, if you like, that's in like shopping malls. And it's based on paleo based foods. So you can, when you're out shopping and things, you can pick up and they do like bulletproof coffee. And it's really amazing. And it's, they still have their problems with their nutrition as well. So it's like one extreme to another. But in Melbourne alone, I tried, my objective for one of the days was to make it around all the cafes. And I think I made it a third of the way in one day. There's just so many. Um, so that was really cool. And then from there, I flew to the States. And my first stop was Paleo FX. So I got to meet Erin there for the first time in person. Um, so that was really amazing. I don't know if anyone here has been to Paleo FX or not, or apart from Jeff and Erin. <laughs> um, so it was interesting. There were some really good talks that was there. Some kind of, you know, very pro low carb, some obviously maybe more against or ketogenic, you know, and it's the amazing thing about science and nutrition is that sometimes it's not always black and white, people have their own opinions and different opinions, so it's kind of good to see what everyone's thinking about from there. And then from there, I think I've literally hit <laughs> pretty much most cities in the, the rest of the United States. Um, it's probably easier to say where have I not kind of been. Um, but as Jess said, one of my key objectives of this trip is I want to go back and do my PhD. And I really, where I come from, I use ketogenic particularly as well, or what I'm interested in is the therapeutic side of it. So now how it's been used for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, MS, neurological disorders. So I've specifically met all the kind of main people that are here based in the States. So um, I met with, I don't know, you might know some of these names, you might not, but Dr. Dominic Diagostino, who's a researcher in South Florida, he's in a lot of really great work in cancer and ketogenic. The same with Dr. Tom Seyfried in Boston. Um, I've met with Adrian Sheck in Arizona and Jeff Bolick in Ohio as well. So it's been a, a pretty interesting tour. What did you like about? Uh, Tom Safri. We had a conversation the other day. Yes. It so made him really interesting. Tom's an interesting guy. Um, he He's one of the ones that kind of has taken forward this theory that cancer is a metabolic disorder, not a genetic disorder. So he's taken on the work of the Warburg effect, basically. And so he's been in this field for a very long time. He knows a lot of people who started off, you know, Richard Beach and all these types of people. And I don't know if anybody knows the political history in Ireland with the fighting that's kind of gone on there and there was a very famous story of the prisoners, so Bobby Sands, who was one of the prisoners who starved himself to death to you know, protest against the, the fights that went on. And Tom Seyfried said with, he's got great conviction with, behind ketogenic but through calorie restrictions. He believes it's a lot to do with that rather than just the carb restriction. And he said that a human being can last 30 days 
without any food. And he, you know, and so I asked the question, well, how do you, how do you know that, you know? And it turns out that George Cahill, who's one of the very first researchers in this whole, you know, starvation nutrition um, research, actually was allowed to go in and work on the prisoners who were fasting in this time. So they actually have samples still in a freezer somewhere of people from Bobby Sands and, and all the rest of the prisoners, but the British government have sealed it and won't let them release the data. And what he found is that after 30 days, basically your muscles breaking down and what they found was that their Bobby Sands in particular, his diaphragm muscle broke down and he basically suffocated yeah. to death. And mm -hmm. there's a point in the human body that there's like a point of no return. So if you start feeding them after 30 days, the, the degradation's happened. Um, so. Doesn't that also depend on their, on their body fat going in? Yeah, I mean, there, there'll be, I suppose, and those kind of things. I mean, I know the prisoners, when they went in, they weren't obese or that Yeah, because somebody that, that, that has that. more body fat, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think what they were keto, looking then, at... Then that covers your, your, your muscle. Oh, yeah, 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 keto was very, very different. I mean, obviously, yeah. they weren't even having anything. I mean, these the prisoners, obviously, just... Yeah, but they're going to be keto. I mean, by starvation, they're going to be keto. Yeah, but I mean, starvation to a certain point, you're going to be keto, but you still need to give your body nutrition. And if you are, but but, but you'll but you'll you'll go off the the body fat for a long time unless you don't have much. For a long time, unless you don't have much. So I think it's something. So Eric Westman says that you can survive every pound of body fat like a week mm. or something like that that you can mm. survive on. Sure. So these prisoners that they had, and mm. back in the day, this was an average. They were average men of average weight back in obviously when this was. I mean now it would be very different sure. because the way that everybody's fatter. Everybody's it's moved on and it's we're yeah. very very different now. So, but it was just interesting to see that there is a point of no return, and that's obviously what they were kind of showing and proving with it. Um, but it was just interesting to see that they have all this kind of data and they won't even sort of look at it as a starting point with it. So, so he's an interesting guy. He has some pretty pretty cool um, stories from there, but. There's a lot of really, and everywhere I've been, the research that's going on in this is the, the states is is far forward from everywhere else. Um, so how about you? Oh, I'm sorry, far what? I didn't hear that word you said. For research, is U.S. is yeah is what is far much ahead? further on. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. For research, okay. yeah, it's research, but people aren't doing it. <laughs> this is the thing. Yeah, it's trying to get it from there into oh. how do you put it into clinical practice. And I know that's what a lot of the researchers are now trying to work on. It's how, how do you mm -hmm. translate that? Because it's easy to see it in a paper. But mm -hmm. What about Jeff Olick and what he's doing? Yeah, so Jeff is now at Ohio State University in Columbus. I went to go and see him there. He's got a very exciting lab. He's been there for about a year now, and he's kind of been given this position at Ohio State and almost given sort of free reign, if you like, with it. And he's now going to be doing purely low carb research coming from there. And he's got him and Dominic Diagostino got very big visions and really, really exciting stuff that's that's coming out. Um, some of it I know I'm still not allowed to talk about. Um, so, but really, really exciting stuff that's that's coming from it. Does free range mean funding? Yeah. Is yeah. that what you were yeah. referring to? <laughs> yeah. So they're funding low carb, high fat, ketogenic diet research which has not occurred no, to the extent no. that it's occurring at Ohio State with yeah. Olick and his group. So the and university is funding it? It's a mix. Yes. Funding it? It's yeah. a mix yeah. from where the sources are coming from. Oh. Yeah, but they are, but the university are very much behind him. Yeah. So. So Food what? industry isn't going to be, but. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, uh, with all the research I've been doing for the show, uh, the, the battle I keep seeing uh, if you look on social media and YouTube and everything else, is there's a lot of people that are not experts, but they're out there just pushing some agendas. And uh, as I was joking because earlier with the doctor, I said, well, my biggest enemy, because I'm going to have a YouTube channel, is going to be the vegans. They're going to come after me. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's going to be a lot of people that are, are going to, in this, you know, we're talking about social media, though where they're going to be resistant to this, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. politically. Um, everything from, you know, because it's been such a big thing. Uh, in fact, I, I mentioned this to some of the people that I have on my Facebook uh, followers, and I have a few vegans who are like, they were not happy with the fact that I was going on keto. Yeah. 
I'm like, I don't think you understand it though. And they don't want to understand it. So it's yeah. going to be a big, huge thing to turn it around for people. Right. So the so idea is to find research to legitimize yeah. uh, mm. what right. this is about. Mm. Right. Yeah, I noticed that because the research, yeah. did, there was a lot of, um, it is interesting because there's a yeah. lot of different interpretations. There is. And I think as well with a lot of the research is, so even like Dr. Adrian Sheck, who is in Arizona in Phoenix, she works at the, the Brain Cancer Center there. Um, she has got normal work that goes on there, but she's not that known. You know, no one kind of really knows about her, unless you're kind of from there or around that state. She's not that known, but she works quite well with the clinical aspect there and the clinical side, the oncologists, and they've got quite a really good setup, but she's just not as widely known in social, you know, she doesn't go on social media, she doesn't really do that side of it. So it's like, how do you take all these people that are really reputable in what they do and you know, make it seem so it's not just another person on, you know, social yeah. media kind of. I, I think uh, every person at every level can help to contribute uh, mm -hmm. to kind of uh, get a message out to say that there is science. There, there is quite a bit of science in the last 15 years to really support, um, you know, um, whole foods, um, mm -hmm. low-carb, high-fat diets, and there ain't a lot of science to support you know, traditional methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, let's open it up. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, I, I just finished uh, Jimmy Moore's um, Keto Clarity. Yeah, Keto Clarity. And he talks about how so much of the research is anecdotal at this point, you know, but very strong anecdotal stories from individuals. Mm -hmm. you know, of what their experience has been, but mm -hmm. um, they really need to do a yeah. lot more controlled well, with groups and things like that. Yeah, but I, there's actually a little bit more than anecdotal. There's some fairly strong, um, you know, two-year, three-year trials comparing, um, you know, low-carb, high-fat diets to traditional low-fat, low-calorie diets, and, you know, virtually all those studies, you see um, improved metabolic markers, better weight loss, so, you know, then the criticism from, from the scientific community is we want long-term outcome studies looking mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, what happens to diabetes, what happens to, you know, heart attack, stroke, death, cancer. And so um, we don't really have that data. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, the other nutritionists from the other side don't really have mm -hmm. strong data mm -hmm. to, to support their cause. And the reason is it's just difficult to... Um, Research nutrition. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is, isn't it? Well, how do you yeah. keep people on something you know constant for a long time? That's yeah. pretty hard to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and let them live a lifestyle, right? Their own lifestyle well, and, I mean, you, and well, control. Yeah, what else you keep it under control? I'm gonna put you in a lab for twenty years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 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 ideal, but you know. <laughs> see how people cope in the environment. The other thing is the environment that you have to live in as well. Um, we were talking about this as well, that the even little things like there's so many drive through I a drive through ATM that I've never even seen before like that was completely really alien to me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know we're, all so we're, we're driving into car park and I was like, Where we're we're going to the bank machine and my friend's like, Yeah, yeah it's here. Just hang out the window and pick your card in. And I was like and then little you know, little things that portion sizes here are really big, you know, and even I found it, and we were at dinner the other night, and I wanted to keep eating it because it was in front of me, even though I was full, you know, it's, it's little things like that, and it's the free refills and sodas that, and sometimes the server doesn't even ask you, they just keep putting yes, free soda yeah. in front of you, yeah. so, and I know, like, there is a choice, and people do have that choice, but sometimes when you get to a certain level, it's, you know, you need to just not have it in front of you, and that's the problem yeah. as well, so it's, how do you live this way and live in the environment that you are in, and... Well, nice yeah, I want to ask if anybody's uh, had this issue because I, I had been on uh, Atkins years ago, uh, the original Atkins, and I lost a, a lot of weight and I did pretty well, but that was probably the number one factor in me not keeping it off was the avail availability of food mm -hmm. and, and the, uh, the, the quick drive-through stuff. And even, even if I was to... Uh, you can go shopping at the grocery store. There's so many things that you get 
just overwhelmed with if you don't read the labels. And then, of course, for me, uh, carbs are you know, very, they're trigger food, so I get, you know, I get addicted so easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably the thing that just set me flying right off the mm -hmm. diet, is little by little it creeps in, and before you know it, you sit down and find a Ben and Jerry, and you don't think about it, and then boom, everything's out the window. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have that? Mm -hmm. It's very easy to get off track a little bit because, mm -hmm. well, like you say, availability, I mean, we keep our larders, our refrigerators, you know, cabinets full of food. It's just the American thing. I don't know, so that's me anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you don't want to see an empty food cabinet or an empty refrigerator, you know, it gets, uh, and, and, and it's so readily, you go, you know, drive a mile to the grocery store and load Mary, up the cart and bring it home. Can you tell the group about your success briefly? Well, yeah, I've uh, been very happy uh, since uh, coming to Dr. Gerber for the first time two years ago in April, last April. Um, he found I was pre-diabetic in late stage three of five stages. Uh, I have three siblings, all with type 2 diabetes, complications, very, you know, sick people, uh, one of which has died at 70. Um, mm. And so, uh, you know, uh, I had an incentive, he says, and when he says, Mary, I take a nutritional approach to this, I just, I was just so excited and so <laughs> delighted. And I said, wonderful. So he, he put me on, uh, suggested a 70, 20, 10 uh, percentage, my calories, fat, protein, carbohydrates, and uh, started that day. He says, eat an avocado every day. Um, his assistant got me onto uh, the Bulletproof Coffee pretty soon, a couple months later. Um, I lost 35 pounds in like nine months, something like that, maybe less, um, which was weight that I'd had on since my 35-year-old son was born. <laughs> I had that weight on me, you know, so um, I took it off. Uh, all my numbers improved. My Blood pressure that was in the 150s came down to the 120s. Um, my blood sugars went down, everything, all my, my triglycerides and uh, HDL actually reversed. So my HDL became higher than my triglycerides, they flipped. Um, and then recently I had a, a check on my uh, carotid um, artery on uh, for plaque and they found no plaque there. So everything is just, you know, wonderful. I'm, I'm so delighted uh, that I came into Dr. Gerber's office mm -hmm. that day. I wasn't looking for compliments. No, I know. <laughs> I know. I thought it was a great story. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so I just have to keep going. And, and yes, it does, it is hard after a while. When you reach your goal, and you say, well, I can do this little thing, or I can have a dessert here, I can do, you know, and it, it can really creep up. So that's why I love coming to the support group, because every, you know, few weeks I get a reminder from everybody here that it's so important to stay on goal, you know, keep going. Well, I think it's great that we're getting international support. Oh, boy. You know, in a, a local documentary, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's we're, it's still a small group, but um, we're well connected. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, when we travel to conferences all over the place, you know, the same names come up over and over again, um, and uh, we're just seeing more evidence to support uh, this approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, anyone else want to tell a good story? Their experience. Um, I can I. I'd like to uh, just introduce Barry. Is um, um, an interesting individual. He he came up from Boulder today, so he is our um, came down down from Boulder. Excuse me. <laughs> so he is our um, uh, uh, low carb, high fat vegetarian. Contribution. Oh, really? and, yeah, he runs a great uh, Facebook support group, and maybe you can yeah. tell us a little about what. You're so, so you're from Scotland. I'm from the Republic of Boulder. We call it. <laughs> 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 um, so, um, well, I could. Let me just try to try to be brief. I hope I can do it. 
Um, so I was a vegetarian since 1970, got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2007, and um, decided that evening in the hospital I would do something better than the ADA guidelines. And um, I figured out that a lacto-ovo uh, vegetarian or plant-based diet uh, would be where I would attempt to take a shot at what I'm doing. And so, uh, so far so good. It's been, what, seven years or so, and I've and, uh, been in keto, uh, ketosis or ketogenic diet for the most part, and, and um, not insulin dependent. I stayed off of the thing. I do take a little long-acting insulin to help my pancreas along. Um, and started this Facebook group. Started this Facebook group, and uh, we're heading towards 2,500 uh, members from around the world. What's the group called? Oh dear. It's the, uh, <laughs> it's the uh, Low Carb Vegetarian, Vegetarian Diabetic Society. Di and Barry also runs all kinds of support groups. In Boulder, I've been up to his support group, oh, so awesome. he's he's somewhat of a leader. Um. <laughs> Can I ask you the uh, you say vegetarian? It's not vegan. It's vegetarian. So uh, people are on the on the Facebook group asking about uh, whether you can do keto and be a vegan, and so we have two opinions. I think in order to maintain the low carb, uh, it's not possible uh, if you're eating beans or other kinds of um, uh, vegan protein. So to my mind, having uh, fermented dairy uh, for the animal protein and having pastured eggs, uh, farm, farm eggs, uh, provides the missing nutrients that a vegan would be missing out on. Uh, there, and I think, and, and I've tried being a vegan, not seriously, I, I, I'm all for um, preserving animal life and, and quality, you know, like we shouldn't be killing things and people. For sure. Uh, but I don't think eating eggs and, and cheese kills animals. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's my, my, um, my hit on it. So, so there are vegans that are trying to uh, manage their diabetes by eating lower carb. But when we think about throwing the fat switch, I think it's not possible to do it when you're eating vegan. Yeah, and it's, I haven't found anyone who's boasting that they can do that without the animal protein. Can yeah. I just ask, what, what do you kind of eat in a day? Can you just sort of... What do I eat in a day? Yeah, just out of interest. Today's a little bit of exception because I came here to meet with <laughs> uh, Dr. Gerber, so I fasted day. this morning. Uh, normal days, I have a three egg omelet with uh, either cheese or avocado or, or leftover vegetables, or if I have a little time, I'll cut up. Uh, little onion and uh, pepper and whatever's around. And then I, I uh, make my own uh, kefir smoothie. I have a kefir smoothie in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I have, um, I, I belong to a cow share program, so I get organic A2A2 protein milk, uh, raw milk from the farm. And then I don't drink it, but I turn it into kefir and into my own yogurt. Mm -hmm. I do my own yogurt. So that, if anybody knows, when you, when you make fermented uh, products like that, it turns some of the, the lactose into lactic acid, mm -hmm. so it re further reduces the milk sugar. So you still get the benefits of the protein. And, and then the A2A2, uh, this kind of technical, hard to figure out what's going on, but there's genetic differences in cows in the milk. So there's A2, A1 cows and A2 cows, so I found this little uh, farm that has uh, three A2A2 cows, and they, have, uh, they provide uh, raw milk members. So that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So um, my morning is a three egg omelet uh, with cheese and or guacamole or uh, vegetables and then I'll make a kefir smoothie and uh, in that I'll, I do fudge a little bit with the vegetarian because I do use concentrated fish oil because I don't see any way around um, the extra DHA and EPA that's missing in the vegan diet. Uh, so I've kind of like mulled over this for a while. I thought, okay, I still, I don't want to cook anything that I that I can't produce from scratch. So that's been my my uh, my my stance for being a vegetarian. Because I've worked in a slaughterhouse uh, on a communal farm. I, I was in charge of the hamburger meat. I saw what they did to the cows. 
And if I was going to have to make my own hamburgers, I, I would be having a hard time shooting the cows like I saw them do, or, or uh, slitting the throat of the lambs. or the. Um, so, so I want to be able to prepare things from scratch. So I'm more comfortable cutting some broccoli than I am <laughs> cutting up the fish. But, but um, so just to get back on track here, so the fish oil, I think, is also essential. And uh, some vegetarians, lacto-ovo-vegetarians, don't like that don't like my position on that, but uh, I'm, unlike you, my incentive is, is health. So if I am going to go for a walk or for a, a little hike to exercise and I want to take a snack along, um, I've said this before, um, if, I, if I take a, some nuts with me and I look at the cashews, I say, huh, that could lead to me getting numb toes or maybe having some amputated toes. If I take the almonds, I'll be able to hike and walk and I'll feel fine afterwards. Is that because the cashews have sugar, more sugar? Cashews are higher carb than, mm -hmm. than almonds. Right. Mm -hmm. So with everything that I'm taking into account, I'm thinking, how can I make this lower carb? How can I adjust this? So I, I don't mind indulging in, in, in um, pleasure and, and um, uh, comfort foods. But how can we arrange it so that the lowest carb possible? So uh, I'll make my own desserts with erythritol or stevia, or sometimes a little xylitol. I would, I would love to have you on, on my cooking show. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff I'd love to see, you know, unique ideas. Yeah. That's interesting. That's good. I mean, melted chocolate, raspberries, and macadamia nuts dipped in, mm -hmm. put them in the fridge with coconut oil or mm -hmm. uh, cocoa. Chocolate bar. Yeah, yeah, you make your own kind of stuff, and it still has the same pleasure outcome, but then you start to feel double good because it tastes good, and also you know you're still in ketosis and you're not threatening uh, going off track. <coughs> so now I'm all over the place. Yeah. So, so what do we eat in a day? Three omelet. I'll have a kefa smoothie. I'll put a few berries in, a little erythritol sweetener or stevia sweetener usually, and I'll put the fish oil in, and I'll put some half of the cup is uh, green vegetables organic cucumber, um, flaxseed oil, a little fish seed oil, and I blend that up, and that's my drink in the morning. No coffee, no tea. And then and I, I work uh, all day in an office. So I see clients myself. So I keep a supply of organic string cheese and little one-portion guacamole cups, organic guacamole mm -hmm. cups. So I use the string cheese as, as a spoon, <laughs> and I just snack on the... Um, cheese and the guacamole or almonds. And then dinner time I'll have a, a light dinner, a stir fry or, or a salad this time of year. Uh, so that's, so, that's kind of my usual routine. So what I like about Barry is just he's blended all these wonderful principles, you know, kind of put them together in, in one place. I mean, we all agree that um, animals should be treated ethically, you know, or not eating, not eaten at all. but. I like to think of common themes among all the nutritional-minded people in the world, and that's what Barry's done. <laughs> he's, you know, he's taken these themes and put it all together. And I'd rather uh, look at what we have in common uh, rather than looking at what we don't have in common. Absolutely, I, yeah. I've learned a lot from Lorraine Cordain. Uh, there's plenty of mediators that have a lot of good uh, things to say from uh, experience, case by case, or from the research. So why ignore this stuff because uh, you're on some kind of bandwagon? I'd rather be able to synthesize and take the best of what everyone's doing and try to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So Jeff and I met, uh, we had dinner with Gary Taubes some years back. He ate a big plate of steak and stuff on the other side of the table and I had my salad and we were fine. We were still friends. <laughs> you know, there was no bloodshed. <laughs> no, like why go there? If people want to eat meat, eat the highest quality. Uh, organic, no hormone, hormones or antibiotics. I mean, find the best source possible mm -hmm. and get all the nutrients from it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then here, we're all friends with eating high fat and, and, and good healthy fat. So I'm glad to be here. I wish I lived a little closer because uh, mm -hmm. it'd be fun to network and, and exchange ideas. On, on the Facebook page, we have over 200 uh, vegetarian lacto-ovo recipes that I keep compiling and Yeah, uh, I'm trying, yeah, that's what uh, I'm hoping to do is be able to find as many unique recipes as possible. Yeah. Uh, and that, I, yeah, I've never, 
it sounds like you got a, a few. <laughs> so. Yeah, I accept bribes if you want to join. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Emily's uh, time is not over here yet, and so um, I actually didn't realize that part of her adventure was looking for uh, a place to do her PhD. And there's some opportunities here in, in Denver, actually, at Anschutz CU Health Science Center. Dr. Richard Johnson, who um, has been uh, looking at uh, sugar and, and fructose as a root cause for years, his research is actually it's in um, uh, mice and rats, laboratory animals. But he wrote a book called The Fat Switch, and he is the, um, the medical director of uh, the nephrology department. Mm -hmm. And um, he's been studying sugar and fructose, and he um, is uh, uh, hosting the premiere of that sugar movie um, tomorrow night. And uh, we have it on Facebook, and it's free, there's dinner, and you should all attend. And that movie uh, is the number one documentary out of Australia of all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a million hits on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's premiering that, and um, he already knows about Emily. And um, if there's time, maybe we could take a tour. You're welcome to come. Right. And I've actually <laughs> seen his, his his research facility. I mean, it's it's in the Anschutz campus is magnificent if you've never been there. And so he's okay. And I hope that uh, they can get to meet each other and, and talk about um, opportunities. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Going to Canada. Yeah. But you said that you're really interested in human research. Yeah, yeah specifically. Right so. We have a lot of animal and cell culture research on ketogenics in cancer, MS, and Parkinson's. But as many people know, and particularly critics of ketogenic, that's all, all they'll ever say is, well, that was done in a rat, a rat or in a sure. cell culture. So, you know, yeah. I'm, but it's a catch-22, particularly in the States, because the NIH will only give funding if they understand mechanisms, which you have to do in, in rat and cell cultures, but they then also want to see how it performs in humans. So how do you do it in humans if they don't give you the, you know, so I've, I want to do it in humans. My background is obviously nutrition, that's my undergrad degree, so I work with you know, patients, so I, that's where my sort of passion lies with it. So I want to see how we can take it from a lab and translate that into clinical practice. So. I was going to ask, what about Gary Taub's uh, research project? Have you been in touch with him? And so what is, what's the latest on that? Yeah, so I've met some people around. Um, so Musi is the Gary Taub's and Peter Tia's group that started up to basically, I think their mission is to kind of once and for all put these sort of questions to bed basically and they've given out money to certain universities. So Stanford, so Christopher Gardner's group was one of them. There is some in Harvard, and then some down south. I can't remember who the last people were. Was it in California or no? No, I, don't know, I can't. There was, there was somewhere else a little bit more kind of obscure because they wanted to just give it to someone that wasn't really involved mm. in it in any way, shape, or form, so there was no bias or anything. Um, we know one of the researchers at Stanford, and I met with her, and it's really, really big projects going on. And then, interesting enough, at Harvard, I actually forgot to tell you this part, is that the people they've given it to Harvard don't know how to formulate ketogenic. So they might actually have to give it to Jeff at Ohio. Mm. So he might be getting some of that. <laughs> um, yeah, because they don't know how to do it properly, and there's no point going into it. Because problem with a lot of the research or the low carb research out there is when you look at the methodology, the diet is never low carb. You know, it's forty percent of carbs. That's that's nowhere near low carb. So it needs to be done properly if we're gonna put all this money into it. So it's still very much at the early stages with it. Um, and there are some really big universities who've got the, the grants for it. So And I just on the you know, just to be positive about it, it's it's a real challenge because mm -hmm. the majority of the researchers don't believe that a ketogenic diet or a low-carb, high-fat diet is better. Mm. So the purpose and of giving it to the people that are... That don't believe. Oh, mm -hmm. is it? And they got have the funding, so mm -hmm. the goal is that they'll set up the experiments their way, mm -hmm. but they have to be proper mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. fulfilling what a low-carb, high-fat diet is. So. Mm -hmm. 
it's 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 a big it's a big uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what makes uh, Chris Gardner. Have you told me the story of Chris Christopher Gardner and how he the A to Z trial and how he was yeah, come. And Sure, that's a great so story. So Christopher yeah. Gardner, who's one of the main people who've been given the money, there was a study that came out a few years ago. Two thousand eight. Two thousand seven. Yeah. Called the A to Z trial, and it was a study that was comparing Atkins, basically Atkins and Ornish were the two opposite ends, mm -hmm. and there was a couple of the calorie control in the middle. And Christopher Gardner, he was a, was he a vegan or vegetarian? I think he was a vegan. He's, he's he, vacillated yeah. back and forth over the years. Yeah. He went into that study to prove, he hands down thought Ornish was going to come out on top. He just, that's what his belief was. And every which way he went on that study, Atkins kept coming out on top. Um, so he basically, he kind of changed the way he ate a little bit based on that. Um, and so it was just quite funny. I remember seeing him at one of the conferences and he said that you know, he went in with an opinion bias, thinking that low fat was the best way possible, and turned out all the analysis. I think he must have kept doing every kind of stat test there was possible, and it just showed that it was it was the Atkins that kind of came out on top for, for that population group. But doesn't so. he look a little bit like John Denver? <laughs> <laughs> was Barry, you were there. That was in 2012. Yeah. <laughs> I joke. <laughs> he's, he's got a great personality. Yeah. So how come you're not just moving to Ohio, moving in with Jeff Olick and get your doctorate there and be done with it? That's a little bit of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably... That's yeah. Yeah. And we, and we that's just exposed it on tape. <laughs> it's official. <laughs> oh, it's a, and it's nice to tour around, no problem there. But. Yeah, it's funny as well because Jeff was... Not the way that it worked out, but... Um, so I met all these people and Dr. Eric Westman, so mm -hmm. that you, probably a lot of people know. Mm -hmm. I was I actually spent two weeks in North Carolina shadowing Dr. Westman as well, and he kept saying, you know, if it's human research you want to do, you have it's through Jeff. That's the only way. And I just didn't know what you know what he had there, and a lot he he always hasn't been purely low carb research based. I wasn't sure, and I was like, oh, I don't know, and it's in Ohio, and I'm not too sure if I want to move <laughs> to Ohio, you know. And I, it's funny, I landed in Columbus and I'd come from Boston where it was lovely weather and landed in Columbus and it was just like walking off a plane in Edinburgh. Like, I mean, it was, it was lovely because I felt like being back home after all this time. The weather was just exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And then I met him and I mean, I sent Eric an email saying, okay, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> it's phenomenal what he has on there. So, and he's, he's very much only want to recruit people now that are passionate about low carb and that's just what they want to do and I think his words to me were for someone to do a trip like this you must be you know, people say I'm either borderline crazy or borderline passionate with the this kind of nutrition so I think you're both because I know you personally <laughs> yeah. a little bit of both it's good it's good though <laughs> so I remember where I've been um it's fun you know visas and things like that I need to go back home before we can start application processes so We'll see. I've, I've been going up to Canada after here, so unless something magnificent happens <laughs> in Canada, um, and then, yeah, I've had to stop with after that. The difficulty in talking about this stuff is that I, I'm imagining with this group here, there's some people that are focused on weight loss, some are focused on blood sugar like I am, some people are focused on other kinds of health issues, and when you think about cancer and, and uh, metabolic syndrome and, and systemic kind of problems, then there's the mental health issue as well about uh, bipolar disorder and perhaps uh, some forms of de uh, depression um, that there's some evidence that the ketogenic diet um, affects our body in so many different ways that it's really hard to say um, that you're doing this without sounding like you're a little bit of a fanatic because every time someone asks me a question I start talking about this stuff and it sounds like wait a minute I, I, how could this be so relevant to so many people and so many health issues and, and so many um, societal and, and, and cultural concerns? Mm -hmm. So it has to do with politics and the food industry, it has to do with um, the yeah. medical history of, of how we come to promote what we do and the drug companies and how research uh, papers are manipulated in journals mm -hmm. and who funds the, the research. I mean, it's it's so pervasive. It's kind of hard to just talk about, like, let's just lose 20 pounds. <laughs> I mean, it, it's such a, a broad topic, yeah. and so important. So I, I applaud yeah. you for 
taking time out to think it through mm. <laughs> and meeting all these cool people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, the, the, one of the reasons why I was doing this is I wanted to get the, the story out uh, and just, you know, show, do it in a funny, you know, like human way. But um, that's one of the things that, that got me to do this was uh, I lost my sister about a year ago from um, uh, ovarian cancer. She had beat it once and then it came back. But she had so many complications from obesity over the years. She had always been heavy. And it was just, it, I just felt like her odds were against her. Because no matter what, she had, you know, uh, type 1 diabetes, COPD, and, and all sorts of other things, inflammation like crazy. And it was, I think that was, that's what really struck me was all the, you know, chemo and all the other things they want to throw at you. It's like, this is, this is the thing that we have to look at as, as being more important than anything is what we're doing with our diet. And um, that's, you know, I, I told Doc here, I said, well, if you want me to be a guinea pig, I'll be a guinea pig because I'm pretty passionate about this. I want to make sure that everyone knows that, you know, we have to look deeper. We have to get outside of the mindset of what the our government saying is supposed to be recommended, and we have to be daring enough to do it. And yeah, I I, I wish I was in Ohio. I'd be like I volunteer. That's <laughs> I'd be happy to. You know. well, they may recruit yeah. some people in Denver. Mm -hmm. You know, it will be a um, what do you call it? Satellite doing the research <laughs> for them. Yeah, I know. I can't remember which ones who said it. But, um, it was during Australia, but someone said it. In fact, I use it as a line in my show that. Uh, Obesity is not just a medical condition, it's also a mental condition. Mm -hmm. And so that's the part that I'm focusing on, is uh, not just habit control, because we all have, uh, by the way, in a former life, I was, I'm a certified hypnotherapist and a behavioral counselor, so it's all about habit control. Uh, of course, I'm not, I'm not in practice, <laughs> uh, but, um, but one of the things that I wanted to do was address our perceptions and address uh, those little things that cause us to repeat the patterns over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it, we have this weird love affair or love-hate affair with food and nutrition. And that's something I think we really need to, to look at. And I'm hoping to shed some light on that because, um, you know, it's, it's I've seen adults, grown adults, act like kids. It's like, you know, you really shouldn't have that deep fried, or no, I'm having it, I deserve it. It was something like that. It's like, rah, rah, rah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, there's a, there's a, it's an interactive response in that, you know, um, when the brain, when the blood sugar drops, the brain is saying, feed me. And if you don't have, if you're not ketogenic and you don't have another fuel source, yeah. um, basically, you know, that's an extremely, powerful drive and it's not just a mental you know it's not just a mental control thing it's it's, well, it's no, like, yeah absolutely when you're when your blood sugar uh, drops down you do get a little an anxious and confused mm -hmm. uh, and in the studies of, of hypnosis and suggestibility you actually become highly suggestible at that time and a lot of people don't realize that but you do you become very suggestible so um, if if you have a, having to have a you know, experiencing low blood sugar while, let's say, buying a new car. <laughs> Worst time to yeah. have low blood sugar. You know, you get a little anxious, a little confused, and you become very suggestible as well. Yeah. Well, and then, and then the other thing that I re remember from Grain Brain um, is that carbohydrates actually speak and whatever it is, you know, that it turns into in your body, uh, actually affect directly the part of the brain that is uh, where addiction lies in your mm -hmm. brain, uh, yeah. and yeah. so um, they're very addictive. But it's biological, you know, biological, not just a mental thing. Yeah, so. it's it's yeah, it's um, it, well, it's a little yeah, it's a, it's it's a marriage between the two because even if you were to remove the substance and don't have that addiction part anymore, you still have the psychological addiction. And that lingers, you know, mm -hmm. it's like dealing with uh, smokers, for example, they quit and they're fine, but 
they say nicotine leaves your body after I don't know, 72 hours or something, I can't remember. But after the nicotine leaves your body, then it's a psychological thing that you're dealing with for a little while, for at least a, you know, a few weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's a little bit different, you know, but, you know. Well, there's been studies to show that uh, a sugar addiction um, is addiction in both the mental, physical, and every sense. Yeah, and, you absolutely. know, the big food industry will tell you that, um, you know, we, we just have to control our cocaine addiction and, and consume sugar mm -hmm. in moderation while they consider, while they continue to give us, you know, addicting foods mm -hmm. and saying it's fine. And, that, and that's why I brought the yeah. suggestibility because if your low blood, blood sugar is low for a little while and you're hungry and that commercial comes on, you see that McDonald's pass you by, whatever, that's where you, you slide off. And become suggestible to it, and you want to get and that quick fix. Smell the, uh, you know, all the fragrances that the restaurants put out, and then you know, in the ear as you're uh, driving by, you know, you if it was you pull in there. If it was bacon. I, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. well, we actually hire people, so when you go shopping, they have um, psychologists and. Um, specific food psychologist so you shop the way you shop is very specific mm -hmm. so food companies can pay more money to have their food higher up mm -hmm. and it's because you shop kind of, and that's why as well uh, food I don't know if they do it here but in the UK yes. they'll yeah. switch the shop around yeah. and that's yeah. so yeah. psychologically yeah. you're not sure where you are and you yeah. see then food and so it's yeah. companies as much as there's a science that goes into the food to so get the right combination of fat sugar and salt together psychology of you shopping is very much, they know how to play that as the well. The music that's piped in in some stores is uh, research that you'll buy more with certain yeah. songs than others. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why they bake the bread in the stores too, because yeah, you smell that smell. baking mm -hmm. bread as soon as you come into the store. Yeah. You want yeah. Hungry and you're trying to buy more. Mm -hmm. Well, you notice that that's, you know, like a lot of big stores have pharmacies. And, you know, you, you typically have to wait to get your mm -hmm. prescription filled and so what are you going to do you're going to wander the store mm -hmm. while you're you know walmart or, or king supers or whatever I and mean, they're they're all they, and and a lot of times they put the, the pharmacy at the other end yep. so that you have to wander through the store yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how many people are, are have been on some kind of paleo or keto diet we, right now, currently, <laughs> and we just started. No, I just wonder if you just started. Day. No. I'm the only one who's just starting. No. Okay. I start and stop. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just starting again. Uh, so starting again. Yeah, well, that's yeah. The, well, those are the people I want to. I'm hoping to yeah. appeal to because I'm the same position. I stop and start. When I do it, I feel great, and when I don't, I feel guilty, and I just want to hide. Is is it true that uh, if you're in ketosis for a long time? Mm -hmm. If you, I heard that if you fall off the wagon, would say, "Ah, oh, this good," then boom, you like two hundred carbs the next day. You're, you're kind of you're pretty much screwed for a while. Oh, yeah. for I a never do two hundred carbs. You know, <laughs> uh, like an emotional, I would have a cake today. You know, no. <laughs> but you know, but I it think takes a little while to get back into ketosis, then, right? It so. depends. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely depends. Yeah. Um, there's difference in opinions, and I've asked every single person who I've seen and met so far their opinion on this. Some people say that it can take a very long, just as long as it did in the beginning, but some people say there is a bit of a learned behavior. And for some people, they can, a few days and they're fine and they don't go through keto flu again or anything those, along those lines. Other people, it can take you a good. There's a difference between in being in ketosis and being keto adapted. So, you know, when your body is yeah, fully kind of, yeah. yeah, then that can again take you that little bit longer to get into that phase. But getting back into ketosis is very individualized. Hmm. I mean, my, my experience is that, and I've been probably keto adapter for five years, is, and I, and I don't, generally don't push it hard. I mean, into like, you know, two or three millimolar ketones, you know, I mean, it's typically maybe, you know, varies between 0.3 to one, millimole or something like that depending on the day or whatever and, and uh, but I can I can quote cheat and then go back and it, it you know once I was pretty well adapted it mm -hmm. you know the, the the metabolic adaption adaptation seems to stay pretty well mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I'll throw out for you I mean is as somebody with you know talking about variability 
um, I happen to have a, a single copy of the ApoE4 gene, which is um, considered both at higher risk for um, Alzheimer's and also heart disease. And we, the, the fours, and, I, and my wife is a, is a double four, so she's at a very high risk, potentially, for, for, especially for Alzheimer's. Um, and we process fats differently. In, 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 in the, the uh, ApoE4 gene does, and, and so a typical meat-based, animal fat-based um, keto diet is suboptimal for us, and uh, uh, especially from a heart disease perspective. Um, we'll tend to, uh, ex especially uh, if you test SDLDL, um, we'll tend to spike on that with uh, um, an animal-based fat, and so uh, my own diet is almost vegan. I do eat some uh, some eggs, and I do eat I eat some shellfish, which um, are particularly pretty decent for for ApoE fours. Uh, but my, the primary part of my diet are are non-starchy vegetable leaves. You know, it's a huge. I probably eat more more salads than a than a, than a typical vegan does, mm -hmm. and uh, and and well, and, and a lot of my fat comes from actually. Um, uh, unfiltered olive oil um, for the polyphenols. So uh, I mean, there is a so just looking at it as a one size fit all fits all, um, depending upon your genetic makeup, yeah. may not be optimal. Um, well said. Yeah. 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 We we I I had called it the days we had a ketogenic story. I dropped the ketogenic story because it might be a different story. Mm -hmm. By the end of it, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, but I'm willing to give it a shot. It yeah. might be, yeah, it might be different. Yeah. They call it a diet is a little off because it's kind of a lifestyle. Is the way I think of it. Yeah. And a couple of other things that I know I added to my lifestyle, and uh, one is the exercise is is very important. Um, and so I am on a regular schedule with the exercise, and I think without it. I probably wouldn't be as successful. Um, so, for me, you know, that's that's where I'm at. And um, yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> I'll just add, right. throw that in. Yeah. So you lost the weight, then you yeah. exercised. Yeah. You and didn't exercise first. Yeah, and also coming to see that's you backwards. every three months. <laughs> every three months. You know, I, that was the other thing. I was a doctor. You know, it's it's very important to have those numbers monitored on a regular basis because that's really, it gives you a big incentive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I, I say those two things, you know, exercise, doctor, you can't. Yeah, uh, to do yeah. it on your own, I, I don't know, I suppose people can. Yeah. But, um, well, the next series after is, is uh, it is, it's a Dave's Big Fat Workout. I have to, once okay. I lose the weight, I'll go into that mm -hmm. to see how that works. Mm -hmm. How much are you planning to lose? Um, 300 pounds, no, uh, <laughs> as, but no, I, I don't plan don't on anything. It is a lifestyle, and you know, uh, we use the word diet, because I, I see diet differently. I see diet as what you eat, that's all. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, but it, it's whatever I, whatever happens. I know that before, mm -hmm. I think I hit a ceiling, and it was very interesting, because when I, I dropped down to, I'm 279, and I dropped down to, I think it was 210. I couldn't get past 210. And I was lifting weights and all this stuff. It wasn't until like years later when I came all the way back that I realized I wasn't eating enough. That was why I wasn't being able to break the barrier because I wasn't eating enough. I learned my lesson. But if I can get down to about that, you know, 70, lose 70 pounds, 75 pounds, um, because I used to lift weights a lot when I was younger, so I'll get back into that. See how that works with ketogenics. See. Should be okay. I actually intermittent. I mean, I, I do a 22-2 intermittent fast. In other words, I you know I, I fast 22 hours a day, and, and you know I'll I'll go to the gym and lift at you know 21 hours into a fast, and it's yeah. I've been reading about the intermittent. Not not a big deal. Fasting. Right. You know, I'm interested in seeing that. You know, we're mm -hmm. doing that, trying that. Anyway. It's so hard to hear that fasting word yeah. right now, yeah. where I'm at. You know, where but you I mean, the other part of it is getting is get, is is getting well keto adapted, yeah. and then the fasting becomes much easier. Yeah. Now you don't do that every day. Every, just every day you just eat in a two-hour window. Once you don't get hungry, it's yeah. easier. Wow. 
Awesome. So. Okay. Well, I think our time is up. I want to thank everyone for coming, and uh, maybe we'll see you at that sugar film and well, the next support group. Yeah.